Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, it's really exciting to see you all here, ready and eager to learn all about what's new in the world of XR and the Unreal Engine. Uh, although I can't actually see any of you because the lights are so bright. Um, so there's been a lot happening in this space and it's pretty cool. My name's Steve Smith uh, and I'm a rendering engineer on the XR team at Epic, uh, working on uh, cool and exciting new features in UE4, specifically targeting XR. So before we go any further, it might actually be worth defining the term XR for those of you who are not super familiar with it. Uh, now, when I first heard that acronym, I assumed it meant extended reality because that sort of makes sense. But it turns out that that's not it. The correct expansion of the acronym is cross-reality. And when you dig a little deeper, it turns out that the X in XR uh, actually re represents a variable, kind of in the algebraic sense. And that can represent anything. So the X could be a V for virtual reality, or an A for augmented reality, or as some as yet undefined concept. It could be uh, an R, say, for real reality for when you take the headset off. But that might be taking it a bit too far. So a year is a long time in tech, uh, and the past 12 months is no exception in the world of VR and AR. We've seen some big new launches on the device front, including the new Microsoft HoloLens 2, uh, Oculus's uh, Rift S and Quest devices with their super awesome inside out tracking. Uh, the Valve Index with its stunning bright high resolution display. Uh, Apple's AR Kit 3 and more. And on the system side, we've seen the OpenXR specification mature to version 1.0. And that's a significant event from a software engineer's viewpoint. Now, for those of you not familiar with OpenXR, don't worry. By the end of this talk, you're going to be an expert. So today, we're going to dive deep into what's new in UE4 with both the recent 4.23 release as well as the upcoming 4.24 release, along with some peek at, uh, a peek at some things that we're looking at for the future. So first off, OpenXR. So this is a new specification designed to allow developers to target one API and work on many different kinds of devices. So we're not going to dive super deep on the specification today, uh, mostly because I'd like you all to still be awake at the end of the talk. Um, so you can show up at the mixer afterwards. But for any, anyone amongst you who's super hardcore and want to go deep on that specification, I can recommend the SIGGRAPH talk by Brent Insko, who's the OpenXR uh, working group chair, and he's also lead XR architect at Intel. And I've included the YouTube link on this slide for his presentation. So to set the scene a little bit, any piece of VR hardware is going to require a low-level chunk of software, kind of like a driver, that interfaces with the hardware. And this is usually referred to as a runtime. And currently, each VR runtime has its own API to expose the features and allow developers to use it. So when you think of a runtime, you know, that could be Steam VR when you download that. Now, currently in the VR space, we've got several runtimes that we need to support to get access to all of the devices that are out there. For Unreal Engine, that means that we have several plugins that we need to maintain and optimize. Now, we've put a lot of work into hiding differences between the different kinds of hardware and the different runtimes that are out there. So by and large, virtual reality development is plug and play in Unreal, uh, at least for existing devices. Now, for future hardware, that potentially could be a different story if things don't change. Now, when a vendor creates a completely new piece of hardware, they either need to create a new runtime or they need to leverage an existing one. If they create a new runtime, now that means that we need to create a new plugin. And that's fine for anything in development at the time that that plugin comes out. What if the, uh, the new runtime comes out and the content's already shipped? Now, as Joe Ludwig from Valve's quoted as saying here, dev teams are ephemeral, games last forever. Now, the chances are that a, a dev team for a game that shipped five years ago is long gone, and porting most likely won't happen. Now, this is where OpenXR will shine. By defining a single API entry for developers and consistent runtime behavior, it will push the heavy lifting of porting onto the vendors. Now, with OpenXR, you don't need to port your game. The vendor's runtime will effectively do it for you. And for Unreal, this means that we get just one plugin, and that gives us way more bandwidth to optimize and innovate. Effectively, it gives us a single point of entry to an unbounded ecosystem, and we're no longer bound to a specific set of runtimes. So this initiative is being managed by the Kronos Group. And uh, the Kronos Group is a consortium of companies all working together, in this case, towards building this specification for OpenXR. But in the past, they were also the consortium responsible for graphics powerhouses such as OpenGL and Vulkan. You've probably heard of those. In this consortium, every vendor has an equal vote on what goes into the standard. 
It also might be worth, out that, uh, worth calling out that Epic worked directly with Valve to start the exploratory group for this, which later became the X OpenXR working group. And Nick Whiting chaired the group for two years. That's uh, Nick's from e Epic. And my colleague uh, Jules Block on the XR team is still active in that working group. So this slide gives you a more visual representation of that combinatorial nightmare that I was alluding to earlier. The market's fragmented across multiple runtimes, each of which has their own API. Some runtime and API combinations are going to run on more than one device. For example, you can use Steam VR uh, and their API on a Valve Index or an HTC Vive or an Oculus Rift or a Rift S. But performance can vary noticeably between runtimes on the same device, which just adds yet more combinatorial complexity, as if there wasn't enough of that already. To run on all devices in Unreal, you need to support at least four different plugins. Now, this is what that picture looks like if we move past the legacy runtimes and, the, and their APIs, and we just go with OpenXR. That tangled web from the previous slide is gone. It's nice and clean and consistent, at least over the surface area that we as developers um, have to deal with. In Unreal, there's only going to be one plugin needed to support all of those runtimes due to that single interface. And that gives us just a single target to optimize and build towards. And we can polish the crap out of it. Also, because this one runtime has consistent behavior, you don't have to worry about any performance differences uh, running the same hardware on different runtimes that we've had in the past. And there's more details on specific examples of this later. Now, it's also worth noting this is an industry-wide initiative. This image was taken from the Kronos uh, website and it shows the companies who are publicly supporting OpenXR. And you can see all of the big players are here supporting this initiative. And this helps to completely open up the ecosystem. It's definitely a good thing. Now, some of you might be concerned that this whole consortium design by committee approach will slow down progress. And sure, creating the version one of the spec for OpenXR took some time. But consider this. It was designed to provide a consistent interface and consistent behavior across a number of devices. That was a complex problem to solve, and doing this properly takes time. But moving forward, we have the means to ensure that innovation is not hamstrung. Vendor extensions allow multiple developers, uh, sorry, allow runtime developers to continue experimenting with new features without the need or approval from the group. It's not necessary for a vendor to go back to a proprietary API to add new features or introduce a new device. This makes specialized one-off devices viable. Vendors have a solid API platform to build on and a baseline to get any application running and a minimum barrier to entry to expand on what's already there or to add new custom features. Developers still have the core API with the stability that that provides. And also they have the choice to embrace any innovations that may inspire them. So up until now, we've pretty much had to hack around all of these inconsistencies between devices, APIs, and runtimes. And there's three main challenges that stand out ahead of the pack in this regard. Now, those are runtime selection, input mapping, and frame blocking. So runtime selection, first problem. Right now, in the engine, we have a priority list in the config files. And unless otherwise specified in code or by a command line, we're going to pick the highest priority runtime that's available on the, the, uh, the end user system. Now, there's no viable way for us to validate that this matches any user preferences that may exist, if they, if they have any. For example, if the user just wants to use Steam VR no matter what uh, with their Oculus headset, there's no system-wide setting to dictate that. OpenXR fixes this. The user gets to decide. The engine or developer no longer has to decide for them and potentially decide incorrectly. The OpenXR consortium will be providing conformance testing for runtimes in this regard soon. Now, as long as you keep to best XR practices, your app is just going to run with any runtime. So with OpenXR, the logic for that underlying runtime selection is no longer controlled by the engine. The engine just needs one plugin for OpenXR. The selection itself is now the responsibility of OpenXR's loader. Until OpenXR has been widely adopted and runtimes have been fully conformance tested, uh, we're still going to need to use that priority list for cases where the hardware doesn't yet have a conformant runtime. And once runtimes based on OpenXR are fully adopted and conformant, OpenXR is going to be at the top of that priority list. Our eventual goal is that developers only need to target the OpenXR plugin, and that'll do all the heavy lifting. And that day will come. And this is an example of what it'll look like for the user in the case of the Windows Mixed Reality uh, runtime. 
Each vendor out there is going to provide a custom UI and a system setting to make their runtime the default. And vendors are instructed to only change that default when the user asks for it. And they're honor bound to play nicely with each other. So next, let's explore input mapping. And this is uh, a pretty big one. And let's look at how that's going to evolve from a sea of hacks to a much more reasonable solution, we hope. At a fundamental level, rebindable actions are a core concept of OpenXR. And actions have been a concept that's been part of Unreal for a while. If you're an Unreal developer, you've probably dealt with them before. Uh, but for those um, who aren't familiar, or maybe a little rusty, here's a short refresher. So first, let's look at uh, some specific examples in that problem space. Hard coding button events, by which I mean explicitly reacting in code or blueprints to a uh, button A was pressed event, isn't an ideal approach. You bind an event to the A button on an Oculus Touch controller. It's not intuitive to remap that. And translating between devices with different layouts or completely different controls becomes impossible. But we can make life easier by not explicitly checking for specific controls. How? By defining and responding to actions instead of those physical controls. So what's an action, I hear you cry? Well, maybe not. An action defies what the user wants to do explicitly. Apparently, you all already know this. Uh, so in the case of this image, we can see that the user wants to teleport. Actually, looking at that image, he possibly wants to teleport to the bathroom. So when we define a teleport action, that action is triggered, and the game logic is going to respond to that teleportation action. We can then bind that action to controller elements in a much more flexible fashion. And rebinding is now completely independent of that final action that we've defined. Conceptually, this is a lot more aligned with how a content developer thinks about their experience. We don't want to think about what does the A button on this controller do. We want to think, OK, I want the user to be able to teleport. Now, when we package all of this together, we end up with something that we call an interaction profile. Now, an interaction profile is basically just a formal description of a physical controller. So for example, part of that profile for an Oculus Touch could be the X or Y buttons or the thumbsticks. So when we build up an interaction profile, we define these controls explicitly for each device. The runtime will take an interaction profile, and it'll map those physical buttons to actions based on the bindings suggested by the developer. The runtime can do the rebinding for you based on the actions that you create. You don't have to ship a new binary. The user can bind controller elements to actions without changing the bindings. Effectively, you ship the binary, you publish the, what it can do, and the runtime can decide how best to feed it. So in the case of a completely different controller, the runtime is allowed to emulate as it sees fit. This emulation part is important, because it means that we could run a profile on a controller that's not even been developed yet. And this is a list of the most important profiles that we have today. Um, and that's not a priority list, it's just alphabetical. You're encouraged to provide as many suggested bindings as possible when developing your game. Don't guess. If you can't playtest the profile, let the runtime do its own emulation. The chances are the runtime is going to be able to guess mappings better than you can, especially for cases where your application is being run on a device that wasn't released when you built it. Under the hood, OpenXR uses URL-like paths to describe the controls on a device. And we can bind URL-like paths to specific actions. And you could bind any number of paths to a specific action. So here we've got an example of an Oculus Touch controller's A, a button on one side, X button on the other, both of those clicks being bound to the teleport action. And we've also bound the, uh, the five index trackpad click to that same action. Now, if you provide mappings to as many input profile, profiles as possible and a new runtime is released to support uh, a new device, that runtime is going to pick the closest existing profile and rebind for you. You don't have to do any work to make this happen. In this example, you probably don't want to click the trigger, though, unless exploding was uh, on your agenda. So we've covered the most important concepts for OpenXR in the general sense. What does this look like in the engine and the implementation that's based on the new 1.0 spec that we released in 4.23? So first, a little bit of history. We released an experimental plugin for OpenXR version 0.9 in the first 4.22 hotfix, so that was 4.22.1. After the 1.0 version of the spec was released, the plugin was improved and updated, and an early preview was released with UE 4.23. Vendor runtimes are still 
actively under development and stabilizing. I definitely wouldn't recommend shipping your game on OpenXR right now, but I fully expect it to become a solid, viable platform over the coming months as the various vendor runtimes come online and become conformant. And we're, we'll be sure to communicate progress as the ecosystem uh, develops. Now, this is where things are for 4.23, which is out right now. <coughs> You'll need to define all of your supported interaction profiles and suggest bindings for them, and then bind physical buttons to motion controller keys, and then bind motion controller keys to actions in the regular input panel, so as you traditionally would do when you're defining any input system. And we currently expose the underlying profile paths, and we, um, we do introduce a few levels of indirection. Now, as I said before, the 423 implementation was shipped as an early preview, so this is not final by any means. Defaults for motion controller keys are provided for common controllers, but this list is incomplete as motion controller keys don't always have a logical mapping to actual controller bindings. And to fix this, it's gonna be a pretty drastic change. We'll need to deprecate motion controller keys altogether, and this is an important takeaway from this presentation. Motion controller keys don't fit in the current plan to have developers target controllers directly. Instead, the plan is to define new keys for each profile and define physical keys in the interaction profiles. So let's look at this currently shipped situation in a little more depth. This is the 423 implementation. We've got common controls mapped to motion controller keys, face button one and two, for example, or thumbstick X and Y and so forth. Now at first, this seems like it's a good idea since we wanna provide as much cross-device compatibility as possible. So defining a common subset seems to make sense. But this, is, this actually illustrates one of the key problems with the mappings in our preview implementation. What does face button one map to on an Oculus Touch or an index controller? Uh, it's just not intuitive. Next, controllers define some of their own specific inputs, trackpad X and Y on Steam VR and the cap touch inputs on the touch controller, for example. So what happens if we just take motion controller keys away? We define the physical controller and each button and control on it. We still bind these buttons with actions, as mentioned earlier. This way, we don't lose any information by using generic face buttons. We also don't lose the abstraction capability of motion controller keys, because even though we define physical buttons, an OpenXR runtime can emulate them on any other controller. So we don't actually lose anything removing motion controller keys, and we get a lot more clarity. It also means when a new runtime comes along in OpenXR, with a new controller, it has a better chance of mapping your specified bindings in a reasonable and useful way. So the end result, it's much clearer what you are binding your actions to. Now we can directly populate suggested bindings from the input settings. We're also gonna um, port legacy VR plugins to this scheme as well in the short term, since it makes so much more sense. Now this will affect you even if you're not using OpenXR, which is another important takeaway from this talk. Okay, so we covered a lot of stuff around how controllers and input will be evolving. Let's explore the extensions that are currently supported in the Unreal OpenXR plugin. So these are the OpenX, OpenXR extensions currently supported by the plugin. If you need new extensions supported, you don't need to wait on us. You can add new extension support using the plugin source code. And you're welcome to engage with us about adding certain extensions as well. We're also gonna architect our own OpenXR plugin to allow a mini plugin style architecture so that we, or vendors, or you guys, can add custom functionality without having to write a whole new plugin or make the huge changes that might be required to the OpenXR plugin. As for the plugins listed here, those first four are required for the various UE4 RHIs, that's the API abstractions um, used for UE4. The composition layer depth extension provides support for presenting depth to the compositor. Uh, one example of the use case for this would be the transparency effect that you get in the Oculus UI um, when it intersects with in-game geometry. The visibility mask extension provides support for masks of various formats that can be used to block out or expose sections of the frame buffer. So for example, areas of the frame um, that aren't visible due to lens distortion or optics can just be discarded early via stencil or so forth. And I'm also showing the uh, Vario plugin here because it illustrates how much easier OpenXR makes it for us to, make, uh, to take more niche custom stuff like the Vario headset and provide support for it. Before OpenXR, it would have been much less simple for us to do that. And the last thing on OpenXR, uh, frame blocking, 
one of the most important and challenging issues that we need to handle in the engine and all of our VR and AR plugins is the issue of frame blocking. Frame blocking is an important paradigm in VR because it's used to minimize latency. Now, as you all know, latency is a critical issue in VR, and we need to keep it as small as possible. Effectively, frame blocking forces apps to send the rendering commands sooner. Um, in regular rendering, we may let the GPU run two or more frames behind, but not in VR. Now, there are different approaches to how this ends up being implemented in production code, depending on the pipeline. In the simplest case, a regular pipeline is just a loop. And the weight here is where the blocking happens, and that's highlighted in red because I do like to belabor the point. The simulate needs to happen as quickly as possible because while that's running, we're not sending drawing commands to the GPU, and an idle GPU is a thing of ugliness. It's extra wasteful because not all simulation is actually latency sensitive. Finally, because rendering waits for the simulation to complete, we have a pretty tight budget since we need to squeeze all of that into 11 milliseconds or less. A better option is the deep pipeline, which is the pipeline that's used by the Unreal Engine. And as a side note, OpenXR is designed to specifically support this pipeline. In this timeline view, each frame is color coded. So red frame, white frame, blue frame, et cetera. It should also be noted that this is greatly simplified. Uh, there's a lot more going on than just the two threads shown here. On this simplified model, we've got a game thread that runs a simulation, and then we have a render thread that does the rendering. In our wait section, right before the simulation, we block on the runtime for our next frame. We grab the current pose information for the HMD and controllers here. These poses are used for the simulation, and then the simulation then hands off to the render section running on the render thread. And here we do all of our drawing and, and submit um, that end result to the display. By moving to a deep pipeline like this, we can effectively run two frames in parallel. This increases our work budget significantly, but the trade-off is a full frame of added latency. In this example, you can see that the total latency between the wait and the submit is effectively two whole frames. So if you're running at 90 hertz, that's 22 milliseconds. But we can pack a lot more work into a single 11, into a single 11 millisecond frame. So we have close to 11 milliseconds available to do simulation and 11 milliseconds to do the rendering. But that 22 milliseconds of latency, and that doesn't even include input latency or latency post-submit from submit to photons hitting your eyes, that's bad. And almost all users are going to notice that. But there is some magic that we do in Engine to mitigate it. So what if we could update our pose information right before we render? We still need to use the pose information for the simulation, so we still need to grab that at the wait section here. And the simulation is going to generate transforms that are going to be used to render and so on. So at the start of the render portion of the current frame, we apply the inverse of the matrices derived from that original pose information, effectively mathematically deleting it. And then we requery the poses at that exact moment and update the relevant transforms. Now we render with pose information that's a whole presentation interval newer. We're effectively cut out that extra frame of latency. We call this technique late update, and it's a setting for HMD and controller pawns that's on by default in the engine. OK, so wait, why is this relevant to OpenXR? Well, uh, this shows the ideal pattern for blocking and late update. Currently, some, block, some runtimes block on the wait portion above, as, as, as we would want. But some others, and I'm not going to name any names, they block at the beginning of the render block. And this is where performance challenges can come in. We've seen almost a millisecond difference depending on blocking behaviors here. OK, so to wrap up the OpenXR plugin portion of the talk, let's talk roadmap. As explained before, we're finalizing the implementation of the input bindings to make them consistent and more intuitive. We'll shortly begin moving overlapping functionality from legacy plugins over to the OpenXR plugin to reduce the code footprint. Um, for now, we're going to keep the experimental label on this plugin while the runtimes and various vendors are still in development. And then the OpenXR consortium is in the process of defining those conformance tests to stabilize everything. In the near future, the OpenXR plugin will be the go-to plugin for all XR development. So next up, details on a few new AR features in 4.23 and what's planned for 4.24 and beyond. So there's four main updates in the 4.23 and 4.24 timeframes. First, 
Unreal 4 now has full native and streaming support for HoloLens 2, plus support for streaming to HoloLens 1. Second, we've uh, integrated some cool new features from Apple's AR Kit version 3. Third, we've updated the Magic Leap SDK to version 0.22. And fourth, we're in the process of unifying all of our AR functionality to be device agnostic. So AR and UE4 is going to more closely match the state of VR as it is right now. So HoloLens 2 is fully supported in UE4, both native and streaming support. And what's the difference between those two? Well, native is packaged content that you cook in UE4 and deploy to the device in the same manner that you would package and deploy to any mobile device. Stream content is content that is rendered on your device, oh, sorry, on your desktop, and is streamed to the device. Think of it as a hybrid approach where you display and track from the device, but you do the heavy lifting on the PC. As a side note, we also support streaming for the HoloLens 1, but we don't support packaging or native for the HoloLens 1. It's pretty straightforward to get it working. Uh, first, make sure you have all the required components installed. Actually, first, make sure your HoloLens is set up and you have all the prereqs installed on your machine. Uh, you also need to be running Windows 10 October 2018 update build 1809. It's a mouthful. Um, all the prereqs are listed on our docs page, actually, so, and there's a link on this slide for your convenience. Now, once those are done, then you set up a UE4 component. If you don't have a device, don't worry. The HoloLens plugin also supports emulation, so you can still iterate on your projects without one. And you can also emulate on a VR device. Once all the prereqs are installed, you just need to enable these two plugins, the HoloLens plugin and the Windows Mixed Reality plugin. And once all of these are configured, project development's pretty standard. We're expecting 424 to be stable enough to build content on but we wouldn't recommend building shipping content until about 425 at a minimum. So packaging for a native HoloLens experience is pretty much identical to how you'd package a product for other mobile devices. You'll definitely want to target mobile level content. It is a mobile device after all. A mobile level content means being careful with your triangle budget, your draw call counts, uh, ideally in the low hundreds for those, material complexity, shader size, texture sizes, and so on. This is a mobile device. There are power, heat, and memory bandwidth considerations, so you can't go full Unreal on it. Don't get me wrong, you can do some pretty cool looking stuff, but it's not desktop level quality. So UE4 provides full support for the unique features of the HoloLens 2. Finger tracking is really good on this device, and it's the primary interface. It comes through on LiveLink, um, and we have sample content to show how this works. Now, if you don't know what LiveLink is, um, it's a plugin available in UE4 for streaming and consuming animation data. So, for example, with finger tracking, you'd get live hand skeletal animation through that plugin um, that you could then apply to content in real time, or you could record and play back later. Gesture recognition you can think of as actions, as we covered in the OpenR OpenXR section earlier. The HoloLens recognizes certain gestures, and when the user performs them, you get an event that you can respond to. Uh, meshing is some really cool tech where the device is going to build a dynamic mesh that's derived from the depth information it measures from the environment. This mesh can be represented in your virtual scene in real-world space, and you can be used as a basis of some pretty cool stuff. For example, physics, collisions, line tracing, visibility testing, pathfinding, navigation, entity occlusion with the real world. Uh, for example, on that last one, uh, the robot in that sample image here could walk off the desk and if he's behind the desk, you're not going to see him. He's going to be occluded by the real-world object. With voice input, you can specify keywords and text. And when the device hears those, it kicks off an event that you can respond to. Uh, spatial anchor pinning is picking a point in the world, uh, you, and you get that point however you want, e.g. through a line trace. Uh, and you can create an anchor at that point. An anchor pinning is a mapping between the real and virtual worlds, which can be used both for persistence, so remembering that position, or accuracy, or to place virtual entities, for example. So you could place a robot at that anchor point. Uh, you could think of them like waypoints in the real world. With persistent anchors, you could create an anchor on the desk, turn the device off, come back later, and provided the environment hasn't changed too much, the device is going to recognize it, and it'll recreate the anchor exactly where you created it. And finally, eye tracking provides information on the user's gaze. So that's represented as array. And you can query that and do all sorts of cool stuff with it. Now, on the other end of the rendering spectrum, we have remoting for when you want more. Setting up remoting is actually pretty easy. 
There's a remoting application available on the HoloLens store that you can just download onto the device. And then you enable the remoting option in the plugin. Then you just play an editor. That's it, easy as pie. So how does that work? So the HoloLens is gonna send all of its information to an instance of the engine that's running on your desktop PC. So all of the eye tracking, gestures, voice, pose, spatial mapping, and hand tracking are all gonna be sent to the PC over a wireless connection. And then in-engine handling of these events is the same as if you packaged and were running natively on the device, except it's happening on a desktop PC. Now that desktop PC is gonna render frames at full desktop quality, and those get sent back to the device. Remoting can also speed up iteration times for when you're developing native content as well, um, since you can just remote test changes rather than repackaging and redeploying. Just be careful to test on the device regularly to make sure performance is okay, since budgets are way different between the two. As a side note, the HoloLens takes into account network latency while it's doing all of this, and it does reprojection to account for it. And it works really well, like the experience is super solid. There is no visible latency. So this slide shows the whole lens remoting in action. We've got three different devices here in a shared space. There's two presenters, each wearing HoloLens headsets, and a filming camera, and they're all networked and accurately placed in the um, simulation space. And this demo illustrates why the streaming feature is so cool. The content you see here is at the same level of detail and fidelity that you would see on the actual device, so see through the, through the device. We're talking 11 million polygons in this scene at the high point, huge textures, complex materials. Um, we're basically leveraging all of the high-end rendering features of the UE4 desktop deferred rendering engine on a mobile device. So each device here has a dedicated high-end PC, so many cores, 2080 TIs, et cetera. And that demo also included full interactivity, so it made full use of all of the gestures, finger tracking, and so on. And we took that previous example, and we rebuilt it, targeting a single-user whole lens streaming experience. All the source for this project, including assets, is gonna be released at some point in the near future as sample content. So if you're lucky enough to own or have access to a HoloLens 2, you'll get to see this experience for real, and it's well worth it. So here's a video that previews what this actually is gonna look like. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. It looks even better when you're wearing the headset and actually looking at it. All right, so we've talked about um, new features in head-mounted AR with the HoloLens. Let's take a look at some new features in the other AR space, magic window or handheld AR. So with head-mounted AR, you see virtual content superimposed on your real environment through lenses that are mounted on your face. Magic Window, or handheld AR, provides uh, another augmented reality option where you can view virtual content superimposed on the real world as viewed on the screen of your tablet or phone. So one platform for handheld AR is Apple's AR Kit framework. 
An AR kit's a framework within iOS that allows developers to create AR applications and take advantage of hardware and software capability of iOS devices. iOS 11 was the first version um, of iOS that included this, and it's been included since. It was first introduced in June of 2017 with AR Kit 1 at WWDC, and it actually used a demo that was built using Unreal Engine. This first release provided the capabilities for developers to create AR applications and inject content onto the real world through the screen of their device. AR Kit 2 shipped with iOS 12 in 2018 and added cool new features such as shared experiences, so think multiplayer or shared content overlaid over the real world, and also persistent tracking, where, device, where the device remembers an object's position in the real world. As of the soon to be released uh, 4.23.1 update to Unreal, we've added support for the new features found in ARKit 3. So this is in early access for 4.23.1 and final in 4.24. Specifically, we've added support for 2D and 3D skeletal tracking, including live link integration and also human occlusion tracking. So 2D and 3D skeletal tracking provides access to the ARKit derived skeletal animation data in real time. If you're familiar with Microsoft's Connect, it's very similar. In the sample image here, the mannequin was animated via LiveLink consuming the data. Using LiveLink is probably the lowest barrier to entry um, to get live animation using ARKit skeletal tracking. Um, but you do have the option to consume that data directly if you wish. Also, using LiveLink, you have the option to record that animation data and play it back later. So think of it as a super convenient mocap solution. 2D skeletal tracking follows a similar path to 3D. Here you can see it in action with various joints annotated in 2D space on an iPad screen. Uh, I tried to strike a good pose here to make this slide more interesting. Yeah, it didn't work. Finally, human occlusion tracking. Now here you can see me in a room with some boxes. Now if you look really closely, you'll notice those boxes aren't real. <laughs> but using human occlusion tracking, as in this example, it gives some ability for the virtual environment to interact to some degree with the humans in the real environment. Um, and you can see those two small thumbnail images at the bottom of the, uh, bottom of the slide there. They're kind of tiny. Um, the one on the left is a segmentation image. Uh, that's basically an alpha mask to differentiate the human figure in the scene from everything else. And the one on the right is the depth image, and that can be used for occlusion and so forth. Uh, you can see from that one on the right, the depth image, that I'm not a particularly deep person. So yeah, it's really simple examples. This is actually all from a, a very simple QA project that we use to test these features. But hopefully that gives you an idea of what's new with 424 and Apple's uh, ARKit 3. All right, so that was a lot of stuff. Um, let's bring this home with a few details on some other cool upcoming stuff we've got going on. The next big work item, uh, and Nick actually alluded to this in the keynote this morning, is a refactoring of AR support in the engine. Currently, AR functionality in UE4 is fragmented with a lot of vendor-specific implementations in blueprint libraries and so on. Now, there's a good reason for this. AR is still a relatively new space, and until uh, recently, different vendors had very different feature sets. To bring this all online quickly required a lot of custom code to support those unique features. Now, as the space has matured, various vendor solutions have converged. Uh, this is very similar to the evolution of, uh, of VR. And in, uh, just as we did with VR, we're now working on combining all of those implementations into a single unified interface within the engine. The idea being that you author an application to target handheld AR, and it just works out of the box on all devices. Now, as AR has matured in the last few years, a core set of features have evolved across all of those devices. And seeing those trends, we can now start building a common infrastructure. We'll handle any edge cases that show up so you don't have to. And as this space matures, more and more vendors are going to expose their technology through OpenXR, which is just going to speed that up. So as a bonus on the AR refactor, we're also working on uh, generalizing engine features that allow for collaborative AR behavior between multiple types of devices. Now, we already support this, but just as, as I just outlined, um, that's not been centralized yet. So different devices require different code. On top of that, networking out of the box is not designed to work easily with AR constructs. You can do it, but we're working on building a library that provides a baseline set of features to bootstrap the networking portion of the experience to make it more plug and play for developers. Now, this, is, this will be built in a modular way so that you can pick and choose all of the bits that you need. Another problem that needs to be solved for a collaborative application is the one of defining a common origin. In other words, 
how do we get all of the devices in the same tracking space? In VR, that's easy. We define an origin point in the virtual world wherever we want. With AR, it's more complex. All devices need to agree on where the origin is in the real world space. And there's a few different approaches that we're looking at for this. Uh, QR codes, for example, mounted on a um, desktop or a planar surface. Uh, Azure spatial anchors. Uh, and we're actually planning support for this in the 425 release time frame. Uh, using the actual device location at startup as an origin, and there's probably more. We're still actively researching in this space. Now, the end result that we're aiming for, you build a project once, and it should be trivial to have it work on multiple different types of devices right out of the gate and have inter-device networking and a common origin just work. So finally, last thing, we're also starting work on supporting variable rate shading. Now, this example image is from NVIDIA's article where they did talk about this technology. Variable rate shading is the D3D12 name for this tech. On Vulkan, it's referred to as using a fragment density map. Since fragment density map doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, I'm just going to go with the variable rate shading. In a nutshell, variable rate shading allows us to specify how densely we shade pixels in different areas of the frame. And modern GPUs provide native support for this technology in its various forms. And used judiciously, it can have a significant impact on performance. So here's some samples of what a density map shading pattern might look like. Now, the one by one tile in the top left, the blue one, uh, that's your standard one-to-one -one shading rate. And this is what we get by default without doing anything. The two by two is a quarter rate tile, so each two by two group of pixels, uh, so a group of four, are shaded by the, sh the same shader instance. So where a single pixel shader instance would normally cover one pixel, now it's covering four. The four by four is, you guessed it, a group of 16 pixels that all get that same shader instance. You can also specify different rates in the horizontal and vertical axes. So you could have one by two blocks, or two by one, or four by two, or two by four, et cetera. Now we have a pretty great use case for variable rate shading in VR. And here's a, a kind of refresher on VR optics for you to illustrate the point. Those lenses in your headset apply a pretty heavy pincushion distortion to the image that's on the underlying display. To counter that and to make the rendered scene look correct, the virtual reality's runtime is going to apply a barrel distortion step during the composition phase of the frame. And that's the one on the, the far right. You can see the barrel distortion, what that looks like. Now, if we assume a one-to-one -one pixel mapping at the center of that barrel distortion image, we can see that as you get closer to the edge, pixels are getting squashed together. Effectively, the closer to the edge you get, the more pixel information is lost. So how does variable rate shading help? The image on the right is the, is the uh, this is a Vulcan thing, so it's a fragment density map. And that's for an Oculus Quest device. Um, an Oculus provided this image for us. Now, in this density map, each pixel in this image, I believe, ap applies to a 32 by 32 block of pixels on the render target that's being drawn to. Now, the density map's an R8 G8 format texture, so 8-bit red, 8-bit green. And the red channel dictates sample density in the horizontal axis, and the green channel in the vertical. So just eyeballing this, we can see that we're shading at full rate at the center of the image, and then progressively lower rates towards the outside, which matches the barrel distortion, approximately, that is applied in the compositor. The result, by applying a fragment density map here, we can tell the GPU to apply less detail as we get closer to the edges. There's very little visual impact here, but a significant performance one, especially on a mobile device. So we already have support for variable rate shading uh, sorry, fragment density maps since it's Vulkan, and this is a Vulkan-only thing, by the way, uh, on the Quest. And that's checked in and in testing right now for 424. We're also going to investigate a broader adoption of this technology, both fragment density map support um, and the variable rate shading support. Uh, and we're investigating that for desktop use. Now, this is definitely something we'll be implementing since the gains are so significant, uh, and we'll release more details as the roadmap for this becomes clearer. Once this tech's in, there's a ton of possibilities for how it could be applied in the future. In the case of VR, uh, we could see even greater gains, for example, with, uh, when combined with eye tracking, where that five degree field of view for the fovea means we could shade even more of our frame at lower rates. Outside of that, in general rendering, there's a ton of possibilities too. And those are beyond the scope of this talk, uh, but I'd be happy to discuss those in the mixer. Okay, we're halfway done. How's everyone doing? 
I'm not kidding. <laughs> All right, I was kidding. <laughs> All right, that's a wrap. So to summarize, lots of cool stuff released already in 4.23, coming soon in 4.24, and there's even more stuff coming after that. Uh, there's gonna be new learning resources um, provided for everything that I've talked about here. So think video tutorials, web tutorials, and all of that good stuff. We're also in the process of a complete documentation revamp to better represent the current state of the engine. Uh, our documentation and reality have diverged somewhat, so we're in the process of fixing that. And finally, I will be at the mixer right after this talk for any questions. I won't hide, I promise. Mm -hmm.